Welcome to Outreach Programming. I'm Mary Jirasi, and today's guest is Mary Ann Carroll, one of the Florida Highwaymen artists. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And we also have Miss Kathleen Henderson from the Black Heritage Festival, who has brought this wonderful artist collection with featuring Mary Ann and several other artists uh, to the Florida Aquarium for a golly event. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start with you, Miss Henderson. Why the Florida artists? Why the Florida Highwaymen artists? Well, they came to our attention. Um, Florida, the Florida Aquarium, the president is Tom Stork, and he is an avid collector. He also has a friend, Tony Hayden, who has a large collection. He has 80 pieces in his collection. And um, Tom Stark is a good friend of Ken Anthony, who is the president of the Black Heritage Festival. And they got to talking one day, and we do a gala event every year where we try to feature someone from Florida. And, you know, the Heritage Festival is about educating everyone and bringing diversity into the forefront. So Tom said, well, I know the highwaymen, and I have their art. And, and Ken said, well, we do a gala. Maybe we could feature them together, and that's how we got together. And it's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful partnership with the Florida Aquarium, and we're so happy to be able to bring the highwaymen here to Tampa. They're originally out of Fort Pierce, and I'm sure Mary will tell you more on that story. And we're just so thrilled to have them here, and the Florida Aquarium is going to show the exhibit throughout the month of um, February or through March 1st. But its opening night is tomorrow, and we're just really excited about that. Now, the Tampa Bay Black Heritage Fest Festival has been uh, getting amazing African Americans. You had the Negro Baseball League last yes, year, which we did. was phenomenally well attended. It was, yes, it was. And we were pleased that we found um, actual players who lived in Florida and went through that time. And they told some, some of the most amazing stories of their experiences as um, baseball players back during the time of segregation and just the experiences they had and how they feel about it now. And the best thing is watching the young people and just looking at them and, you know, because they always hear history. They think people don't live who, who, or who aren't here anymore who experience those things. And then when they, they, you see them and, and they're looking, they say, but that's history. How could you still be here? And it's to show them that history still lives. You can make history and still live on today. So that's what we call our living history piece. And last year we had um, the Negro League baseball players. The year before that, we had the Tuskegee Airmen. And the year before that, we had the descendants from Rosewood. So wow. we just we do try to do it every year, bringing history, education, and culture to the Tampa Bay area. And amazing, like you said, oral history to actually living legacies, living historians that you could sit down and with, talk with, just like mm -hmm. we can with Mary Ann Carroll. I'm going to talk to her okay. for a few minutes. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tell me a little bit about this culture. Um, Tell me how you got involved in it and what it was like to be part of it. Let's start out with, how did you end up being an artist? How did you end up painting with the Highwaymen? This sounds very exciting. Well, actually, from my childhood up, I could always draw anything that I saw, black and white. But I didn't know anything about the uh, colors and color uh, because I always thought that was a, mag a book or something. You know, like when we were small, they'd have the... National Bellis has catalog come through the mail and the wall to fill, and we'd look through those, and I thought that color come from a machine. Oh. And But when I was older, I met a gentleman named Harold Newton, which is uh, actually the father of the black artist in, in Fort Pierce, and I said the father of the black artist. <laughs> and he was, 
he had flames on the side of his car, you know, and the flames caught my attention, so I went and talked to him. I was never afraid to talk to people, but I was bashful, but, and he was telling me that he did it, and it was sort of amazing, you know, so then he let me know he was an artist and et cetera, so one day later, sometime later, I don't know how long, I was coming down Avenue Q, and I saw this guy in the yard painting, and I pulled up and then sat and watched him paint. And when he got through, I asked him, would he show me how? He said, yes. Yeah. So eventually one day I went over there and he had a board, 18 by 24, and he mixed up all my paint and told me where to put it. And this is what I did and uh, needed two palm trees to make it look like a picture, I guess. So <laughs> he, he assisted me. Basically, basically, he put the trees in, but I got the credit for them. And so this is where I started. And other than that, I was fumbling with paint from then until now. And I still, even painting now, there's some things I discovered that I didn't know then and some things I might discover later that I don't know now. But it's always a venture in, into the artist world when you, it's just like walking through the woods and never know what you're gonna find. How, how old were you when you discovered painting through about, Mr. Newton? I think I was about 16, 17 or wow. something like that. very young. Yes. yes. And what was it like for you? I'm no offense. I mean, back then, no problem. African Americans weren't being taught um, art skills and no. painting. You know, um, the arts hadn't opened up to them. And uh, did it blow your mind? What was the feeling you got when you sat there and went, you know, here's paint. Here's someone teaching me. I mean, it must have been an amazing experience for you. Well, he didn't really teach me, but he showed me the basics. Okay. And I, even now, I guess I'm still asleep. I haven't, you know, woke up hysterically yet, you know, because I, I'm grateful to God that it's happened in my life, but I never thought nothing about today. Maybe I would have did a different approach at that time if I would have felt like I had to know something about it, had to say something about it now. Never a dream, never imagination, nothing. It was just something I liked, and I just pursued the issue. And later on, found out it make a dollar. And Were gave. you surprised? Did it sell these? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very surprised, and I raised seven children behind painting and painting pictures and painting houses and stuff like that. And I just take it all as gratitude from God, blessings from God, and thank Him for this young man passing through my life. And then I met Mr. Backus, and I had about three paintings. I took to him one time to to give me an idea of were they good or were they bad, and he said, "Well, that's all right, you know." So he was always a man. He was a white guy. He's a uh, the artist, the renowned artist in Fort Pierce, A.E. Backers, and he was a man that uh, saw no color. He, human, no human color. He was a man, his house was open to the world, and uh, he received people with no, nothing but love. He was just a guy, he had his life, and you accepted him the same way, you know, and, he was, and throughout my art, the life of my art world, I've met some um, wrong people and some right people, but I learned that people will respect you as you respect yourself. And this is what I give credit to the human world of the artist world that I've met. I give them credit for that, you know. I was never disrespected. I'm not going to tell you that some things might not have been said that, you know, hey, no, yeah, okay. I can imagine. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like someone pushed this stuff on you. They, they re received me as I was and I was, because I didn't worry about them whipping me because I was pretty strong. I treasure strength and wisdom, and, and I could handle them. I think when I was about 16, I could, threw a guy about the size of the cameraman over there. So I was never afraid, you know. <laughs> you know honest, honest, I, I used to love to play cowboy and Indian, you know. And, yeah. and I used to love to wrestle, so I didn't have a problem with self-defense. Yeah, I like and to I'm hear grateful. that. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. No, and I'm grateful. My size, yes, I did okay. Yes. I was skinny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> So you're 16, you're 17, you're mixing paint, you're figuring it out, you're coming up with technique. Did your parents say anything about this? Did they think you were wasting your time? Did they support you? Did they get it? What was going on with your family? Well, my mother was a hard worker, uh, worked in the fields and stuff, and she always admired what I did, but she didn't know anything else to do but just admire it, you know. And she always told other kids they should be like me, but oh. then it created a problem in the, in the family that a lot of time people think you are throwing off a one, but the point was she wanted all of us to do to do well and do things constructive. 
And she saw something in me, but and she never did want, never once tried to discourage me. She was maybe not encouraging because she didn't know how to be encouraging, but she was never discouraging. So they let you paint freely? Yeah. I'd go outside and tag it up on the house. So what happened paint when up. the money started coming in? Were they surprised as well? Well, I was actually married and out of the house and the money really started coming. The rest of it was just giblets and whatever, but um, insurance people come out of the house and they saw the painting on the wall. And if it was up there and they wanted to buy it, they bought it because the money was necessary. Mm -hmm. So then when I got out, um, I moved out of the house, um, I started selling them. And the first time I went out, them went, had a, it was Livingston Roberts, and it was a, about three or four other guys, three or, two, other, two or three other guys. And he had paintings, and I had painted up about five, and I had them at the house, but I hadn't went out to sell them because I didn't know how. I guess I was waiting on somebody to come by and take them. Yeah. <laughs> so I was over the house that day, and uh, they said, we need some money. I said, uh, the other guy said, we ain't got no car. I said, I got a car. I'll take you if you have me sell mine. Okay. I ran back to the house, got my paintings, and went back, and we loaded up in the car and took off. And lo and behold, one of mine was the first one sold. Oh. And uh, <laughs> so it, it was a gratifying day. Was, I think I made $72 that day. Wow. What year was this? Do you remember? Oh, this was way back. Like way the 60s? Back. Early way, 60s? Somewhere like that, yes. 72 in one day. $72. And that was more than my ex-husband was making in two weeks. Wow. <laughs> wow. That must serious. have been amazing. It was. I was so happy I went and told him, and he might not have liked it too well because oh. he, <laughs> he didn't comment it on too much, but uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was gratifying. So the me. lady of the house is bringing in the, the bacon, right? <laughs> bringing yes. home the bacon for the family. Yeah, but I never, I never allowed that to um, cause me to try and dominate uh, True. The, the part of my life in the house and his. But you still felt great on the inside of it. Well, I felt good, but I felt good for the whole family, you know. It's true, your whole family yeah, benefited just, from your, yes. your artwork. Yes. So what I'm hearing here as well is the sense of community. You're all in it together, you're all painting, you have no idea what you're doing, you didn't know where you're going. We got paintings, we don't have a car, I have a car, bring your paintings, <laughs> yes. and you were all very much, yes. was it a family? Were you supportive? Were you competitive? What was the nature of the Highwaymen group together as artists? Well, natu well, basically, we all weren't together. We had our own separate uh, lives and, and, and times going out to sell and whatever, and we all did separate. That just one day didn't happen, and um, I took advantage of it from then on. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes the guys would take my paintings out. This is where, when it, the name Highwaymen first come up, it was Highwaymen, uh, because nobody really knew it was a woman involved. Yeah, so they did never identified you as a Yeah, because I was the only fly in the buttermilk. <laughs> <laughs> the only fly in the yeah, buttermilk. And, I, yeah. <laughs> and it was it was it was it was gratifying to me and that um, So they'd pick up your paintings if they were going somewhere, you might grab a couple of and help each other sell them occasionally? No, there was a young man named Al Black, uh, one of the best salesmen that ever ever lived. He could sell an Eskimo um, An ice cube, yep. Yeah. I've heard that one. <laughs> A refrigerator to an Eskimo, right? Yeah, and he could sell, yeah, yeah. sell a mosquito jacket. He was just, <laughs> he was he was very, very well uh, versed when it came down to salesmanship. And eventually he started painting too. But he'd take out anybody's paintings that uh, that didn't want to go out. And, and me, I didn't like to go out that much, so he was always welcome to take mine. And there were a few times that uh, we'd go along with him. Uh, if he didn't have a ride, my daughter, she would take him and whatever. And it was a thing that, Everybody respected each other, but I don't think if we all went out together, nobody want the other one to be making the most of the money because it would have created some problems. So yeah, you need to have your own yes, edge. Yes, and so. your own style. This is what yes. I've seen when I uh, you'll be seeing the paintings uh, from the aquarium and some things from online. Everybody kind of maintained their own style too. I mean, we, the, you were all doing landscape, very yes. similar to the uh, Hudson River painters. It was a movement of landscape. Mm -hmm. But the colors, the style, the technique, again, very uniquely your own. Yes. And even now that if we all paint, would paint the same scene, there would still be a little difference in it because uh, you don't see out my eyes and I don't see out yours. And it's just a thing that the world, you can't go and uh, monopolize a, a set of the world. No, you can't paint this. You, you know, And it's just a thing. Some people call it copycat, but it doesn't matter what it is. The world is there. And you see it as you see it, and I see it as I see it, and this is what makes the, the beauty of life. 
uh, one man's uh, junk is another's treasure and all this stuff. And it's a, a situation where um, I just had to stand and, 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 and be counted because I felt like uh, if you did it, I could do it, you know. Yeah, it, it was your world too. Yes, yes. And you stood strong in it the whole time from 16 years old. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, and most of the women though, I guess the reason I was the only one I... Because you could wrestle, no. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't doubt that didn't have something to do with it. <laughs> I, never, I never saw a task too hard to challenge. Uh, you know, I never saw a, a mountain, you may say, too hard to climb, attempt to climb. And I just have always felt like uh, if you did it, I can do it. But there's some things I didn't challenge, but it was it's just because I guess I didn't want to. And I always desired to observe people that had something to offer worthwhile. Like I used to watch the men doing carpentry, laying bricks, mixing cement, mud, and all that stuff. And I learned to do all that stuff at a young age. And, wow. And my, my, my concept of life was, because I have two hands now, I mean, I have two hands a year later, and I tried to make use of both hands, you know. But you go like a even-handed. If I lose the right one, then I can use the left one. If you use the left, you know. And it's just a part of life, learn to do, try, just thinking, what would I do without this or that? But it sounds like you never let being a female get in the way of any of your dreams, your ambitions, never, or never, your learning capabilities. Never, never. The only thing I might didn't know where to go to get it put in action. <laughs> <laughs> but right. I never I never had a fear of um, uh, going. Putting yourself out there right. and learning it and doing right. it. So that was an amazing feminist yeah. yes. feeling even back then. You were you were way beyond the now movement, way before the women's liberation. Yes. You were who you needed to be in a man's world, and you succeeded, and you thrived, and you competed without any fear. That's amazing. And a funny thing, and not funny, but uh, a mom, they used to, like, you know, think times were hard then. This is something I've never really discussed in the matter, because I am writing a book and some things I would like to keep ever new. Sure, you know? fresh. <laughs> but she would, like, uh, there were a lot of people junking cars and stuff, and I've taken an ax, and we've cut cars up oh, with an ax, God. and... I'm serious. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Loaded them on the back of a truck, and I've driven the truck to West Palm Beach to the, to the scrap iron place and yeah. uh, sold the junk for her and took the money back to her. And My life had been exciting. It was, it was rugged, but it was exciting. You, know? you had no fear, it sounds like. No, and I just, the first time I learned that a spark plug would bite you was when I was driving a truck and it started skipping. <laughs> I jumped out and raised up the hood and looked at it. I said, oh, this is what it is. I grabbed the wire and stuck it back on the spot. Oh. <laughs> From that day to this, I can tell you, it will bite. <laughs> We're lucky you're still here, huh? <laughs> yes. We didn't lose you or your hand. Tell me about some of the art supplies now. I've also read some interesting stories that whatever they had, they painted on it. It could have been a piece of tin. It could have been a piece of cardboard. It could have been... Any product. Tell me, yes. tell me how you got your art supplies, and, 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 and did you have fun maybe finding something on and transposing it into art? Did you uh, actually use alternative art supplies type things? Well, when I started selling, I didn't, but when I was practicing, I did. I painted on, um, um, what do you call this stuff? Plywood. Plywood, yeah. Yes, I painted on that, and other than that, there was uh, ups and board, and I think some was using masonite, but basically at the time I used ups and board. And between ups and board, when I couldn't find that, I used canvas. It was easier and less messy to deal with, and so, uh, but there's some of, whatever a person decided to do, they did it, you know, artistic. Art whatever arts. they could find, yes. and I saw it. I saw this don't litter. <laughs> It's in the, the JPEG. I'll be showing it to okay. you. It says, don't litter. It was painted on metal. It had rivets all along it, but it was the most amazing yes. painting. Yes. It's like, oh my gosh. Like you were saying, one man's yes. uh, junk is another one man's, man's treasure. treasure. It was yes. a palette. Mm -hmm. yes. And to take this piece of riveted metal and turn it into a work of art that says, please don't litter. Yes. It was functional. It was seen by many people. It was placed out there. It's yes. extraordinary. Yes. I want to ask you about your colors. The Highwaymen colors, I mean, it's almost like psychedelic. And I was doing my research for the show, and I spent like a several hours just staring at the colors. Where do your colors come from? 
out of the mind, the heart of the mind. I've seen many, um, believe it or not, colors in the, in, the, in the universe, different times of weather, different settings of the sun, different. There's sometimes the sky go down in such beautiful colors that unless you have a photographic, photographic memory or an instantmatic camera, you can't, uh, you can't do them because they move so fast. And if you see a color and run back, let me get my pen to draw it, it's gone when you get back. It moves yeah. just that fast. And there have been many colors in the sky that most people never see because they never look up. And uh, I just, me personally, it's based on the way I feel. And I was thinking, I don't know whether that was this morning or when, the last night I was thinking, I said, um, I get some loud colors sometimes. I won't go into that right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> some loud colors. Yeah, but, but 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 I've seen them in different times and maybe different places. Sometime I'll take a color I seen in that particular sky and put it with another sky. And uh, and basically I do this because uh, the sky have no definite pattern. And I look sometime I'll see a a tree that I like. It might be. No, nothing may be around it, but grass is always uh, efficient, dirt is always efficient, and water. And no matter where you go, you're going to have water and you're going to have grass. So it may be a condo sitting there now, but it was a tree there before. So yeah. I take out the condo and put the tree in. Wow, so you just create your yes. own and I environments. Look at, yeah, and I look at things, well, I look at things sometime and I see it, but then uh, it doesn't last too long now, so I go back from from the past, basically, and put it in the future. I, I want to get back to Kathleen on that. Mm -hmm. um, ages gone by, the Florida highwaymen have captured the Florida of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. It wasn't tourists buying this artwork. It was Floridians, it was Floridian. people going on vacation. The guy who lived in St. Pete, my friend's dad, you know, going up to the back of the car and buying a couple of these paintings. That is so inherently unique. It, it's a historical reinterpretation of what these artists saw, but at the same time, it's the last time we'll probably ever see any of this interpretation. Well, I is that important? Say it, it is very important. Um, the, the highwayman's art is a historical picture of the landscape of Florida, of the ecological changes that have gone on in the Florida landscape that's so um, relevant to the climate, to um, just the preservation of ecology and this earth. You know, everybody's concerned about global warming, etc. If you view the highwaymen in their art, you can see those landscape changes, and it makes it important for all of us to take a minute and stop and say, we need to save our wetlands, we need to save our swamps, we need to save our earth. So it is very important and the highwaymen have been inducted into the Hall Art of Fame. Um, Governor Bush has pictures up in the State House. There are people who are collecting. You can't buy their art anymore no. for a dollar. <laughs> right. <laughs> and not for a dollar anymore. You have to be shocked. Some of these paintings sold for $25 on a good day are now valued at $3,000, $4,000. Yes. Does that blow your mind? It would blow my mind. <laughs> yeah. it it's does. amazing. It's, 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 it really is, yes. And they're on eBay. They're all over the they're place. All over. And uh, but if they you make want to see them, get on the internet and look statement. up Highwayman Art. Uh, we're going to have to wind down shortly. I can't believe how quick this went, but I did want to touch up on another thing with both of you ladies, if you want to chime in. What I got from the Highwayman art is that it was very personal to Floridians. Yes. They loved it, and it's like this is my piece of artwork where the average poor working guy, my friend's dad, was a bus driver. Mm -hmm. He could buy a piece of artwork that he liked, put it in his home. Yes. Uh, Florida Highwayman art was also known as motel art, which sounds very negative. It could be disparaging, but motels of Florida had it. Uh, restaurants, diners, everywhere you went, you probably popped across one of these pieces because I think people felt personal about it. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, oh, uh, yes, yeah, yes. And the reason they call it motel art, it was actually di to discredit the art. That's why it was called motel art. But people bought, I painted murals and, um, Driftwood Motel, I didn't um, no name, oh, I'm sorry. 
But I've painted murals and, and motels and, and car, car dealerships and, and all of this stuff, and it was just that uh, they they liked it, and it wasn't to discredit it because it beautified the place for yes. them. For them. But it reminded them of Florida. I, yes. I think they felt it was personal. Yes. What do you think, it was. Kathleen? I think that you're absolutely correct, and I think that people in Florida own it because this is home. Exactly. This is our home, yes. and, and look what these people have given us as a gift of our home. Absolutely. Something that we could treasure forever. Yes. And one of the interesting details I found out about was uh, one of the Highwayman paintings ended up in a Steven Spielberg movie, Catch Me If You Can. Yes. <laughs> they're doing a motel scene where they're dancing on the bed, and right there is a Florida Highwayman mm -hmm. art piece yes. in a Hollywood movie. So mm -hmm. it's not escaping people. No, it's not. And, and it's all over. It's in Europe. It's all over the United States. Everybody knows about the Highwaymen. And that makes them know about Florida. And so that makes Floridians very proud. It does. It does. Now, well, we're getting ready to wind up our show, but I wanted to um, ask if you have continued painting, and what are you painting now? Basically the same thing. You're still doing your Highwaymen landscape? Yes. I also do abstract. I did some still life and whatever, basically, um, basically the same thing, yes. And why are you continuing your artwork? Does it do something for you? How does yes. it make you feel? A lot of time, a lot of time when I'm painting, I drift away into the painting. I, I forget to eat. I've, I've, I've set drinks up to drink, I mean sodas and water to drink, and I end up in all my ice be melting and sitting and I'm still working because I've ventured out into what I'm doing. It's like a meditation? Yes. And sometimes I get out there and get stuck and can't get no further and I have to stop <laughs> because and it, it's amazing. It's amazing what it do for you. Well, we're so honored to have you and we are so honored to have you to uh, have brought the Florida Highwaymen to Tampa Bay Community Network. Thank you. And uh, continued success in everything you do and thank I'll, you. I'll be looking for your book now thank that I've you. met you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for joining us on Outreach Programming and uh, stay tuned for more shows.